The Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. Welcome to Dispute Resolution in the Metaverse. I'm Miles Geffen and I'm a legal, legal director in the Insights team at Mishcon Dorea. We're delighted to be hosting today's Arbtech event and to see so many of you joining us and taking the time to complete the registration questionnaire that informs today's discussion. As many of you will know, Mishcon is very active in the law tech space, both through our incubator, MDR Lab, and also through the work that we do with our clients and intermediaries in the law tech space. Um, the metaverse offers a blank sheet of paper when it comes to regulating commercial activity there. And, and what's happening in the metaverse um, isn't likely to stay there. So what's just as interesting about how disputes might be resolved in the metaverse is seeing what learnings can be exported from the metaverse into the real world to revolutionize traditional loop services delivery and also practices and processes. Before we start, just some housekeeping. This event is being recorded and um, we plan to circulate a film of the event along with uh, a paper discussing its outcomes to everyone who's on this, um, on this event and also to um, others who will be interested. Um, we're hoping that this will be a discursive event. Um, you'll all have joined um, without uh, video and audio. Um, but if you'd like to contribute, please um, do ask questions using the chat function and we'll try to come to you during the discussion. Um, as you'll see, we have a really impressive array of discussion leaders and the event is going to be moderated by Sophie, Sophie Nappert. And those of you who know Sophie will know that she is a force of nature. She's a dual qualified solicitor and advocate and full-time arbitrator. She has both a civil and common law background. And earlier this year, Sophie co-founded Arctech. As you all know, it's a global online community driving cross-disciplinary dialogue on technology, dispute resolution, and the future of justice. So I'm going to hand you over to Sophie now to introduce our discussion leaders and to kick off on today's event, which I very much hope and expect you're all going to enjoy. Sophie, over to you. Miles, thank you so much. And thank you, Mishkon Derea, for kindly uh, hosting uh, this um, event with us. Um, I. At Arctech, we have been talking about the metaverse a great deal. And we wondered, because we talk about Web3 economy, there are numbers, as, as usual, with the hyperbole of this field, the numbers in the trillions and with loads of zeros added, that talk about uh, a potential that is um, extraordinary. We can already see with the phenomenon of NFTs um, the potential that this offers. Sotheby's, for example, has put uh, a, um, a business uh, premise on the metaverse, uh, as has Binance, uh, the crypto um, uh, trading platform. And the great thing about the metaverse, as opposed to the social media that we know at the moment, is that it allows uh, economies uh, to flourish between participants, uh, as opposed to, for example, uh, in the gaming business, which are very centralized and uh, where players are not encouraged and sometimes uh, cannot at all um, transact uh, between each other. Of course, uh, whoever talks about um, economies emerging talks about transactions and talks about disputes. The, the very interesting thing that one finds when reading um, the plethora of information online about the metaverse is that very little is said about disputes. A lot is being said about decentralization. A lot is being said about um, self-sovereign identity. A lot is being self about, is said about, um, about community governance. What does that mean for disputes, which are uh, classically um, centralized into courts? And in the case of international arbitration, a little bit more decentralized in that you can have an ad hoc system of arbitration. But still, at the same time, we, are very, we very much congregate around understood processes, understood rules, and where arbitrators are not uh, is not peer-to-peer -peer justice, it is a different thing. So to talk about all, all, what all of this means today, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm privileged to be uh, moderating um, this panel, which really are, they are discussion leaders. They, each of them has chosen one of the topics to which you have provided uh, your feedback when you registered, for which many, many thanks. We have been absolutely thrilled to see the enthusiasm and, and the insight around this, uh, these questions. So we've chosen each of these themes and each of us 
will or each of my my panelists will actually take the lead on these we have so values we have structures we have actors we have due process and we have enforcement and to um i'm just going to say a brief word to um introduce our discussion leaders and then i will put up um a little slide that uh, sean has put in well, why don't we look at it now and i'll introduce everyone afterwards uh sean if you could move to the next one so this is essentially you can see a little bit the progression between uh the original web and then the web 2 which is where most of us are at the moment with social media and then web 3 which is where the metaverse uh, proposes to kickstart and you can see that we have a progression from something that you could only read not write not interact with and now with web 3 you have read write and own transact buy nfts buy music M the medium as well the static text to interactive content and to what i was talking about the virtual economies the organizations went from companies putting out information for others to read to platforms such as the social media platforms that we know and now it's going to be about communities and network the the last uh the last um line for me is interesting and i i very much welcome our our uh, panel's views on this is the the first version of the web was uh conceived as being decentralized and then when web 2 happened this was the the blooming of big tech and it became very much centralized and i i wonder i put a question mark there because i wonder whether web 3 will be irresistibly taken over by big tech or not, and, and what we can do, whether it's desirable uh, for there to be uh, that centralization to a degree, and if not, what we can do to prevent it, especially from a dispute resolution point of view. So I'm putting this out there for us to think about and for my panels, my panelists to, uh, to talk about. So Sean, thank you for this. And I'm going to now introduce um, everyone. We have uh, by uh, in alphabetical order, Federico asked, who graduated in economics and philosophy. He holds a PhD in management. And he, of course, is the founder and CEO of Kleros, which is a legal tech company that uses game theory and blockchain technology in dispute resolution. Sean McCarthy is one of Arctech's moderator. He is an Irish barrister, a New York attorney. He's a former deputy counsel at the ICC Secretariat in Paris, so he knows all about centralization. And he privately, uh, he previously, sorry, acted as a legal consultant in the blockchain sector for a Swiss blockchain for supply chain startup. He is a current ICC uh, young arbitrator representative, and, and he is, as I said, the ArcTech, an ArcTech moderator. Alessandro Parombo is a tech entrepreneur. He's a, the CEO and founder of JUR, which also uses and um, offers rather dispute resolution services. And he advises uh, public and private entities on the topics of legal technology and blockchain. He is admitted to practice law, and he holds a PhD in public law and a master in global regulation of markets. Colin Rule is the CEO of Mediate.com and Arbitrate.com. And in 2011, he co-founded Modria.com, which is an ODR provider based in Silicon Valley which was acquired by Tyler Technologies in 2017. Then from 2017 to 2020, he served as vice president of ODR at Tyler. And from 2003 to 2011, Colin was the director of ODR for eBay and PayPal. He is the author of Online Dispute Resolution for Business, and he's a co-author of The New Handshake, ODR and the Future of Consumer Protection. He is currently the co-chair of the advisory board at the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution at UMass Amherst, and a fellow at the Gold Center for Conflict Resolution at Stanford Law School. So as you can see, we have uh, true experts talking to us about the metaverse, and then um, uh, they will each do a very short eight minute or so presentation on each of our, thought, uh, of our themes, and then the rest of the uh, panelists will engage with their point of view on each of the themes. And you are more than welcome. Uh, I, we will obviously weave in uh, the points that you've made uh, in, in uh, response to our poll, uh, but you're more than welcome to add anything you would like to add uh, in the chat and we will pick up uh, how, as, as much as we can. So I will move on then with our uh, theme of values and Alessandro is very, kindly accepted to, to to lead us on that. And I just wanted to ask Alessandro, I mean, 
the immediacy and, and the fact that the metaverse is deals with people who are anonymized or avatars. I mean, how does that affect the values that underpin this future resolution? Must we, because that's a, also a theme that when I asked my panelists to, to uh, participate in this event, I said, this is our chance to create from scratch uh, a completely new dispute resolution system. And I wonder to what extent we should hold on to the values that we already have and what we should let go of, Ali. Sure, I mean, Sophie, thanks a lot. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, hello everyone. I'm, I'm very excited to be here uh, today with you. So um, I, I, I'm going to try, Sophie, to uh, I mean, express a few maybe concepts regarding this uh, topic. And uh, mm, let me begin with one very high level uh, observation. Uh, so when we talk in general about Web3 or in general about, I mean, um, this area of, I mean, topics, I, I think that we, we should remember that um, what is going to happen in the next few years it's, is always uh, something that regards a problem of coordination. So uh, the entire set of these technology is going to be um, redrafting rules of coordinating, let's say, organizations or communities or groups of peoples. Somehow, eventually, according to some, I mean, some people, and personally, I'm one of them, maybe, you know, the same, you know, structure of civilizations or societies maybe could, could, uh, evolve in something different. So cloud countries or network states could be one day, maybe in a few years from now, uh, something. So um, why I'm, I'm trying to you know, put this as a, a kind of foreknote. Um, in general, when we discuss the topic of dispute resolution, uh, we are discussing um, a problem of coordination between individuals, between entities, between businesses, and this problem so far has been solved with um, essentially third parties uh, very often, I mean, managed by public um, entities or let's say public powers uh, for um, helping, supporting in defining, composing a controversy between two individuals or businesses and so far and so on. So my first observation about you know, the values is that um, in general, I mean, um, the new landscape will redefine how, you know, the coordination between individuals will, will operate. And this redefinition for sure um, should increase at least the transparency of the relationships. If we think about, you know, in strict terms about the blockchain technology, for sure the auditability of most of the events or all the events could be, you know, could play an important role. And in my own view, what it will be, maybe one of the key aspects of the evolution on the values is that um, this new, I mean, the Web3 that we are, we are lucky enough to, I mean, be um, as, you know, we are, we are assisting to this new phenomenon. We will be assisting to this phenomenon in the next few years. We are in a kind of lucky and cool position. Um, uh, I mean, it, it, it's going to be, um, it's going to reorganize communities according to you know set of economic incentives that should produce better results even when the parties don't know each other so instead of trusting sophie because i know you this is you know one of the key principles if we think even about you know to uh, about the big bitcoin network um, i don't need to trust sophie because she is sophie but i need to trust a specific architecture that is executed by smart contracts that every one of us can you know go and check and that architecture produces a series of economic incentives that should guide the participants to that coordination uh, of events or organization and i will move the trust from from a single person to the entire set of rules so in this context it seems to me pretty reasonable to uh, assume that the dispute resolution service or concept that this new economy would like to have needs to follow similar principles. Why? Because I don't want anymore to trust a single individual because someone told, hey, that specific individual is going to be expert and that's it. But probably I want to trust a different system where I can check and verify by myself how, for example, 
the decision maker is appointed, how the decision process happened in a transparent way. Eventually, I might ask you know, a review of the decision to, from another expert and so far and so on. And the key element of this is that compared to probably Web2 solutions, I think that we will assist to a kind of pivot of the so-called concept of dispute resolution in something a bit different that somehow maybe one day won't be in certain cases at least defined even as dispute resolution. Maybe will be technically just a, an oracle or a so-called human oracle that will intervene and will provide interpretations or will assist the parties before maybe the so-called disputes arises and uh, in a different way. So I would say that probably one of the core values that I think we can discuss today, because again, it's it's we are at the beginning. So it's uh, just a chat and many concepts will somehow uh, mix today. But I, I think that personally, the, the, the value that I'm more excited about is going to be a kind of revolution where instead of having a maybe centralized approach to, again, dispute resolution, we will assist to the creation of architectures of uh, this let's essentially architectures that will um, create the right set of incentives in order to ensure that the trust that a decision which will be trustable and qualitative will be adopted so this is one value that i think it will in any case have a specific role and why this is so important it's so important in my own view because if we think in terms of you know relationship between states and individuals i think that we will assist to a switch from you know a citizenship which implies today the subjectivity to be subject to a specific set of solutions already in place into a model where the sphere of private autonomy will be enlarged so this is the second value that i would like to bring into this discussion in my view the next 20 years will be inspired by a growing value of private autonomy that will be expressed by the chance of individuals to choose and choose more how define the relationships even when a pathologic event happens and why this is so important because again personally i'm absolutely interested in somehow you know even the concept of nations if you if you if you think it's it's relatively new i mean it's 18th century it depends on the area of the world so what i'm saying is that um, it is not written in the stone as many times we said with uh, federico with other friends that in other chats I mean it's not written in the stone in, in the stone that dispute resolution should belong to states rather should belong to the most efficient solution and uh, i'm personally mm, you know convinced that somehow a wisdom of the crowd enabled by decentralized infrastructures should create through iterations, of course. There is, of course, a need of several iterations, but I think we'll create better, better solutions. So um, again, probably the second value is a kind of growing uh, element of private autonomy, which will you know, create new types and forms of solution. And finally, just to maybe answer to your question, uh, I think that uh, one phenomenon that we should all monitor in any case is the one of the pseudonymies or economies based on pseudonymies. Uh, why? Um, the concept of this, this would require a very long chat. So I'm going to be short and then leave the floor to other discussions. So I won't be complete. But in my view, one of the core values behind this switch and progressive movement from the so-called web 2.0 to the so-called web 3.0 even if now apparently everyone says web to web 3 um, is the you know the switch from uh again an in-person and maybe physical based reputation into a reputation that is attached to a digital identity and uh, the re reputation and the internet is a very wide topic for in computer science in general. So, but to, 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 to tell you maybe my own, let's say uh, again, uh, at least something that I'm interested in, um, in my view, um, we will assist to the growth of economies that will be linked to um, 
entities, not necessarily representative of my name, for example, Alessandro Palombo, but maybe a digital representation of, I don't know, my activity that will have its own reputation. Maybe my reputation can be one day moved from one pseudonymy to another one. And uh, this is going to be a very interesting phenomenon. Also, maybe for you know reducing you know inequalities because we want to know if the, the color of the skin may be of a service provider there are already experiments in place i mean people joining stand-up meetings in daos without i mean showing their face in video and similar things again clearly initial experimentation so i would say one of the core value will be a switch let's say of the concept of reputation which is of course a consequence of a new system where economic incentives will drive the proper solution and in general but again this is not a value i think that behind the concept of pseudonymy on the internet there will be a lot to do so clearly the dispute resolution systems of the future will have to consider and address this element and again probably there will be a lot of, to discuss about you know how the enforcement of this decision happens but this would be maybe the, the next topic. So this day. is my point, yeah. Thank you so much, Ali. Uh, Colin, I wanted to turn to you on this because uh, um, I, I recall you saying several times when you were interviewed about your work at eBay uh, and, and devising the ODR platform there that uh, 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 if, I'm, if I'm not wrong, a core part of its success was the engagement of the participants and their willingness to see the platform flourish. And I Absolutely. wonder if you foresee that uh, it's going, you're, we're going to have the same phenomenon in, in on the metaverse? Well, it's a great question. Um, I personally think we're going to see the emergence of many metaverses. And I think the cultures in each one of those metaverses are going to be slightly different. When I was at eBay, um, there was a very strong sense of community. There was a sense of what, what relationship do we have with each other? Uh, and it, if two members of the eBay community had a dispute, it seemed reasonable to bring in other members of the eBay community to listen to their, their arguments and say, we think this is a fair resolution. Well, then I moved to PayPal and we set up the exact same dispute resolution mechanism where two a buyer and a seller on PayPal would have a dispute and we would bring in other PayPal users to listen to the dispute. And they would say, why? Why do I care about these other PayPal users? I have no connection to them. You know, we don't, if you don't, if you see someone pay with a visa card, you don't go, oh, hey, I'm a visa user too. You know, you and me, we're visa buddies. No, I, so I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a wide variety of different implementations of the metaverse. And these are all going to be overlapping um, communities. And they're all going to have their own different levels of um, commitment and connection within those communities. And that's, and I think that's to be welcomed, to be honest. I, I well, Precisely. I, I, so I wanted to move to your topic, which is trust. Sure. And, and when, we, when we discussed a little bit this, uh, this panel, you said, I just, I just want people to stop thinking in that legal box. I want them to step <laughs> out of the legal box. Well, this is, what, this is the, the opportunity that we have, right? Uh, sure. uh, and when you say there are going to be met, many metaverses, are you thinking many types of, of, of dispute resolutions as well? Very, very multifaceted? I think so. I mean, again, if you're looking at who is currently building these metaverses, obviously Mark Zuckerberg has gotten a lot of attention uh, renaming Facebook Meta, but his his uh, former nemesis, the Winklevosses, have announced that they're going to be building their own metaverse to compete. And now we have existing metaverses like uh, Fortnite. I'm presuming they're going to continue to build their ecosystem. Yeah. So it's not like we're going to have one metaverse and everybody's going to plug into it, you know, like William Gibson. It's it's. Uh, I think it's going to be it's going to be a patchwork. And I think each community is going to make their own choices. Now, the good news is, again, I, 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 it's very easy. I think uh, Alessandro and Federico know that I can start to get into my crazy sci-fi futuristic uh, gobbledygook. Um, but guess. one thing, my guess. yeah, that's fine. That's fine. This is a community that welcomes that kind of, uh, <laughs> that kind of pontification. Um, although predicting the future is always a dicey business. I will admit that. Um, but one of the things I will say is, Again, having worked at eBay and PayPal, which were sort of, I, I think, one of the pioneers of Web One, as we say, you know, e-commerce really was the first, um, the the function that really created the internet. In a sense, was how can we buy things? How can we find things that we want to own? The next Web Two was really pioneered, I think, by the social network companies, um, and and I think Web Three, it's still TBD. You know, who's going to play the key role? Which which communities? I mean, if you go back and you look at e-commerce in the early days, there were thousands of, of e-commerce marketplaces. And what happened was consolidation. And the network effect means that all of, the, all of the work gets consolidated into big players because 
if you own a fax machine and the only person that owns a, that owns a fax machine, it's not worth anything. But if somebody else buys a fax machine, suddenly the value of your fax machine goes up. And the more people that buy fax machines, the more value comes to you. So there's a real centralization effect, I think, in a lot of these technologies. And I think what that means is we're going to see many metaverses created, and then we're going to see consolidation over time. And I think that's going to put in the hands of the administrators of those metaverses great authority to figure out how are they going to operate. Um, I think what Ali was talking, around, talking about around uh, identity and reputation, that's a huge component of, of uh, life in, um, in, in Web 1.0, Web 2.0, and Web 3.0. But I, one of the things I say, I love the quote that says, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. I mean, I was resolving disputes on Second Life 10 years ago, and we were wrestling with many of these same questions. I mean, uh, Second Life never hit scale, maybe because the technology wasn't ready. We didn't have our Oculus glasses yet, uh, but now we do. Uh, so is now the time when that vision of this sort of shared um, uh, space is going to come to fruition? We'll have to see. But people don't fundamentally change. If you were to take a young child out of uh, Shakespearean England and then drop them into an elementary school here in Silicon Valley, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart from all the other kids by the time they got to age 13. So I think people are not changing. And also dispute resolution fundamentally is not changing because the way that we conflict with each other fundamentally is not changing, even though the means that, that we use to communicate with other parties is changing quite radically. So you can go back to Mesopotamia and you can find examples of negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. I think this whole notion of the legal model for resolving disputes is a relatively modern invention, actually. Um, so I think we need to continue to figure out how do we update these mechanisms. Every society throughout human history has had to have a way to provide fast and fair and consistent just resolutions to disputes when they arise. And I think that the contours of the society when those systems were created dictated their design. And the legal system is very much based on geography because the world within which it was created was a geographically proximate world. But that is not the world that we are moving into. In the metaverse, time and identity and location are very fluid concepts. And we're going to be interacting with avatars from people all over the world. And the notion well, exactly. of what, yeah, what jurisdiction are you in is a meaningless question. And even mm -hmm. in international arbitration, we spend a lot of time thinking about, well, what is the site? What's the seat of the arbitration? Yeah. That is not a meaningful question in this new world. So we're going to have to reinvent these mechanisms. But fundamentally, negotiation, mediation, arbitration, those are timeless. They are parts of the human condition. And we are migrating the human condition into the metaverse, and it is coming along with us. So those mechanisms will come along as well. And we have an obligation to reinvent them based on the contours of this new environment we're moving into. But I don't think that they're going to be fundamentally different in terms of the needs they serve. We are going to need to civilize these metaverses. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to build a new civil society, and it's going to have to address the same needs that were addressed in the offline world. We're going to have to do it online. Um, but but I don't think we're gonna, the values, as Ali mentioned, are, are not changing. It's the structures that are going to change based on the contours. So just very quickly as a point of, um, of procedure, I, we have said at the beginning uh, that uh, people were welcome to put their questions in the chat. So I think that's fine for them to do that unless... Uh, Unless there are difficulties, there's one question, Colin, that's popped up. I wondered if you if you might uh, say a few words. Sure. Um, someone, um, someone, David Wilson says, uh, I, "I hope you'll comment on the types of disputes that are likely to arise in the metaverse, and isn't that the answer to that question the driver as to what structures we're going to need?" The types Absolutely. of disputes. Now, I don't see personally. I mean, obviously, you know much more than I do, but. I don't see that the disputes are going to be all that different from the disputes that we have today uh, in terms of, you know, they're going to be commercial disputes, and disputes yeah. transactions, disputes about people's rights. Uh, you know, I should have been paid. You didn't pay me. Uh, I didn't get the NFT that I, I bought. Maybe you need a little more imagination, Sophie, because I think there will be some <laughs> radically new concepts of things we're going to need to wrestle with. I mean, I will say, again, I play Elder Scrolls online. I'm a, a bit of a, an embarrassing addict to that particular met. Now, is that a metaverse? I have an avatar. I run around in this virtual space. I engage in transactions. I partner with groups. I join guilds. Now, the norms for resolving a dispute within a game like that, where I'm slaying dragons, is very different than if I'm going to be in a Horizon workrooms and I'm, you know, working on brainstorming with some business colleagues. 
or you know, a, a gaming in, uh, metaverse. And I think a lot of these things are going to come out of games. There was a long time we, we actually had a conference. What can the legal world learn from these massive uh, multiplayer online role-playing games? Uh, we hosted that conference for several years and there were a lot of insights to come from gaming. And I think that if, if you look at the metaverses that are being designed, they clearly have, they're inspired by some of these gaming environments. But the norms for dispute resolution and behavior in those environments are very different than in a trading environment like eBay. And if eBay was to create a metaverse platform and you were buying and selling, you certainly wouldn't want someone to come over and hit you with a sword if they disagreed with you. So I think we are going to see, much as Matt said, you know, behavior is different and we're going to have to create a certain level of interoperability. Now, again, I think commercial um, environments are different than social environments, which are different than gaming environments. And I think we will see a thousand flowers blooming in terms of how each of these communities will, and also the level of social cohesion, as I mentioned, between eBay and PayPal is different. So that shapes the dispute resolution process. But I think when, uh, when David talks about, um, you know, the different types of issues that arise in the metaverse, I mean, I've resolved, I resolved a dispute in, in a second life. It was essentially a zoning, it was a housing dispute between neighbors. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there was a very high value mountain in one area of Second Life and people were buying plots of land and somebody built a house which was crazy below this other guy's plot of land and it wrecked his view. So do we have precedent for that? Sure. I mean, obviously that happens in, in the face-to-face -face world, but the resolutions that were available to them were, were quite a bit different than, than resolutions that were possible in the face-to-face -face world. We had at PayPal many, many disputes over purchases in virtual worlds where somebody would have a really powerful sword in World of Warcraft and they wanted to sell it to somebody else and then they sold it and it turns out it didn't have all the powers because it only worked when you had the armor that you use the sword with and they didn't sell the armor so the sword wasn't worth as much money i mean we don't have those disputes you know in the face-to-face -face world those are those are new kinds of issues and again yeah. these are more consumer level issues it, once we start to get into the kinds of disputes that are handled in international arbitration more commercial issues i think we go back to larry lessig i think the code is the law and i think we're going to be creating these walled gardens where the software provides people can't break out of the transaction environment at ebay and paypal we could decide the buyer had to get a refund from the seller and we would take the money from the seller and give it to the buyer, even if the seller wasn't happy with it because we controlled the software. And I think fundamentally what we said about Linden Labs that ran Second Life, they were not a, a judge. They were not an arbitrator. They were gods. I mean, they could take the money out of someone's pocket and put it in someone else's pocket. They could take away all their property. They could eliminate them and ban them from the universe where they could replicate them and make a thousand of them. The options that are available for dispute resolution in the metaverse are mind boggling. So we need to think about how we use that power judiciously so that people don't feel like they're subject to the capricious whims of the, of the administrator. Mm -hmm. I think one of the main responsibilities of the metaverse administrator is going to be providing fair and consistent and transparent impartial resolutions. And if people are in a metaverse where they feel that the gods are acting capriciously, they will use their power of choice and go to another metaverse. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Colin. I mean, there are questions for you in the chat, but I wanted to move on for a minute to actors um, with, uh, with Sean. I mean, in, in, in the answers to our uh, poll, Many of you have, uh, I'm talking to the audience, have talked about the, uh, the, the place of AI in the metaverse and, and will, because Colin was talking about Mesopotamia, th these were humans resolving the dispute on PayPal these, and, 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 uh, and eBay. These, was all, these were also humans uh, resolving the dispute. On Kleros, there are humans resolving disputes. Is there really that threat about AI on the metaverse and does it matter or is there going to be a partnership or people? Uh, AI working alongside humans in the way that uh, many of us have been um, thinking about uh, in the past few years? Yes, absolutely, Sophie. I mean, I, I think the, the great thing about getting the feedback in advance of the session was just seeing kind of the, the predominance of this, this exact question by, by a lot of the, the respondents saying, do we or, or are we going to be led by AI in terms of decision making, or uh, is it going to be hand in hand, or is it going to be a human led system? And I think uh, Colin has has made very very good points about the just the the ability for um, decision makers in these new worlds to to craft remedies. And I think it would potentially, I think at least currently in the current state of the tech, I think it would be very very. Um, dangerous potentially to allow AI a full um, 
full remit to, to make decisions on its own. And I think, and, and we've, we've seen uh, events like with Ferdinando Samaria, who is one of the foremost experts on, on, um, on, on AI and, and machine learning. He certainly doesn't have uh, high confidence in the ability of AI as it currently stands to make those decisions alone. And the reason, unfortunately, is, is that you can feed uh, all of the inputs and you can feed a methodology uh, potentially at, at the start to it to an AI, but you have no control or no visibility as to what kind of decisions or, or what, what are the, the major factors that they're basing their decision on. And unfortunately, I think for that reason, it would be very hard to, to instill a lot of confidence in users. I think, yes, it would be very, very probably quick and dirty and it would get the job done, but I think there would be a lot of um, a lot of controversy created and unnecessary controversy created by by AI led um, um, dispute resolution systems, even in this in this environment. But if you pick up on on what Alessandro was saying, where he he sees the the whole concept of reputational, you know, individual reputation as a decision maker, and and, and that's also been picked up by uh, Primavera de Filippi in her. Her, her work on blockchain and the law where she talks about the displacement of trust into a process or a, an individual decision maker towards trust in the, or confidence in the technology. I mean, how, how does that, I mean, humans are, become not irrelevant, but a little bit more secondary. Sure, and I think, I mean, we're, we're going to have to create economies of scale. And I think that's where the AI and the machine learning programs do come in is, is as a time and an effort saver. And I think that's, unfortunately, the, I think the, the, at least for now in the current state of the tech, as far as, as AI can go, but you're seeing these things, like you've seen the example of this do not pay AI, which was uh, in London and, and New York, and it was dealing with traffic tickets for people. And it's successfully overturned like 160,000 traffic tickets. So it was basically like an AI advocate for, for um for for its clients and and so i think in that sense and in that context we're going to see a lot of a lot of upheaval and a lot of change but i i think fundamentally the human element and the human confidence or at least from the user's point of view in a human decision maker will remain and i think for that reason potentially us as a legal community need to maybe recalibrate what we think is important and maybe we need to stop thinking about being advocates first and start thinking about maybe being decision makers first in, in, this, in this new metaverse and, and in these types of environments. Uh, because if not, then we're going to potentially suddenly lose relevance um, because of these, these very, very practical and very easy to create or easier to create um, AI programs that could, that could take our, our advocate um, role very, very easily. What is the role of the legal representative, do you see, uh, in, in that new environment, if any? Uh, yeah, I mean, if any is, is, is really the open question, and, I, and I'd, I'd hope that maybe people in the audience might have um, good, co good contributions and, and good thoughts to, to make as they have already in, in, the, in the feedback. But I think it, it has to be user-led because crypto natives, they don't, they're all about code as law. They don't buy into lawyers and, and what lawyers say and, and the, 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 the charges or the fees that, that lawyers might charge to, to resolve their disputes. They want, they want justice now, they want, um, they want their NFT back or they want their money back and they want it in, in a matter of hours and days. And that's just not, unfortunately, the, the current, um, the current and, uh, and, and lawyers are lawyers are there to provide legal advice, and and we have a question in the chat who says, well, with metaverse, is is there still a law, a, a legislative role at all, uh, or or is that gone, uh, or what form does it take? I, I think I think both Alessandro and Carla have made the very good point that really it's the design of the system that will be the beauty of 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 this kind of environment because if you front load all of the the art and the, the kind of dispute resolution design, you can really avoid any of this um, kind of intermediation, the, this um, popping up of, of expert middlemen, and then the users being kind of disenchanted and saying, well, I have no idea, there's no transparency to this system, how could I ever vindicate my own rights? Uh, therefore, I need, therefore, I need an expert. So I think that keeping this transparency, as, as Alessandro said, um, keeping the kind of ability to simplify or to at least streamline the dispute to be able to say that, okay, the user, even if they're not a legal 
a, a legal expert may be able to use whatever tools are available in the market and, and prosecute their own case and, and get to, a, get to um, a decision. Thank you. I'm going to now turn to Federico on the topic of due process, um, which uh, one of our um, uh, participants quite provocatively has dubbed in the, um, in the response to our, our poll one of the most overrated concern in arbitration. I remember when uh, Federico and I started uh, being in dialogue uh, about Cleros and, uh, and the dispute resolution design systems that when I mentioned due process, uh, it just did not resonate. And yet now it is one of the topics that is, very, that is looked at quite seriously by the Cleros um, scholars, that the, by the, 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 pro, the, the, the Cleros um, uh, individuals who are looking at those, uh, those very important topics that underpin uh, the Claros system. So Fede, what's your take on the due process, on due process in the metaverse and is it, it, does it have a future? Um, well, let, let me um, uh, agree that due process is important, but the question is like, what do we understand by due process and what different people understand by due process might be very different and might be not what lawyers typically um, understood by, by due process. Let me share a short presentation uh, to explain what I think. Um, are you seeing my screen? Um, I'm, first, let me tell you a bit uh, about some very young guy from Buenos Aires, uh, like five years ago, who at an interview uh, with Max Kaiser, he was um, uh, telling uh, him that the, the future of the digital solution was going to be the metaverse and we will have the disputes happening in real virtual reality worlds that would be resolved by, I mean, AIs and humans and on some blockchain, you know, platform. Um, and I mean, if you, you can watch the recording, I mean, this, he was like looking at me like with this like jaw dropped. Uh, and, uh, but you know, all of these things that um, we were discussing at that interview in 2016, imagine how early that was, I mean, kind of started <clears throat> happening. I mean, the, global economy kept globalizing you know more people working for uh, all everywhere from like, freelancing and making payments and getting payments in crypto and crowdfunding you know tokens flying around from different countries to other countries and investing in projects everywhere um and um the the, the case we used typically use to 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 um present claros and decentralized justice in general and which would takes us into what is due process is you know a typical situation of our time. I mean, this woman from France, she hires some guy from any country, you know, Guatemala, Argentina, whatever, and then they make an agreement and they don't know who they are because they are uh, just uh, anonymous and they are pseudonyms into a network. And then there is, um, if there is a dispute, you know, you cannot solve this through international arbitration, right? So, how Claros works. So the payment uh, is done into a smart contract and then both parties by using this app, they basically agree to use Claros as an arbitration clause, as an arbitration seat. Um, so uh, a dispute happens and then Claros is going to select a panel of, of people who are going to uh, analyze this evidence. And this, these people are I mean, anonymous. Uh, they don't need to um, prove their identity and they don't need to prove they have the skills to resolve the case and all this is done on uh, a blockchain which is in the case is ethereum blockchain and this is very important for due process as, as it's typically understood the fact that claros is built on, on blockchain means that uh, no one can tamper with like the evidence of this case and no one can tamper with the selection process of, of the jury and not even the founders of, of Claros or, or, or any other decentralized platform, right? Um, this quite resonates a lot with what um, Colin said, you know, uh, we're not God, we're very powerless. This is the process that is encoded into the community um, made uh, system and which is going to be executed exactly as was coded and no one can change this, not even the founders of, of the company or, or anyone else. So this makes a very important part of the process. You know, parties can trust the system because they know that the arbitration is going to be carried out exactly as it was coded into the contracts, right? So in this case, let's say that uh, the, this, the arbitrators, the rule for um, Alice, so uh, she 
gets her money back from the escrow uh, account and that ends the, the situation, right? Um, and as I was saying, uh, a very important part of, of Kleros is that um, anyone can be a, a, an arbitrator in the platform. Um, this woman, she's, um, she can be anywhere in the world and she doesn't have to like log into any app. She just needs to buy a token and this token is like a lottery ticket, uh, which gives you the right to be drawn randomly as a as a arbitrator in in Claro's cases, so Claro's has different uh, courts. Um, so you uh, the, the wannabe juror take the token into a court, and then Claro's randomly of all those that uh, select take their token into a court will draw a number of of, of, of jurors, maybe like five or whatever, and these people are going to make the decision. So when I present this to lawyers, I mean, imagine well you. Uh, Sophie, when you first got into contact with this, I mean, that's, this is not at all how uh, arbitration works in the, in the world, right? In the con traditional context. Um, and um, so use cases for this, of course, uh, e-commerce, e um, insurance, you can use this in some traditional settings, but what, what is more interesting is how this is evolving into, into the metaverse. Um, and the first step, uh, is um, games. So the, the first like massive, you know, uh, metaverse use case we have is like esports. Esports, you have these teams playing different uh, countries and with uh, avatars, no one knows who these people are. And there is a dispute because one team claims that the other team cheated. I mean, and what, where are you going to resolve this in the traditional world of arbitration? I mean, this is going to be very hard to resolve a case of anonymous people in 20 different countries uh, over an amount of money that is going to be probably a very small amount. Uh, in order, so it doesn't really make sense to go to, to arbitration for, for uh, something like this, right? And the, 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 the way forward, is like, uh, of course, it's more metaverse. Um, the metaverse done by Superberg, which is the metaverse where the, um, I mean, uh, the platform owner really is God. I mean, Facebook digital solution system is run by, uh, you know, uh, I typically use the the world of like a, a, a king or like a monarchy, but really it's, um, you see, I to take Collins, uh, you know, metaphor, it's like a God driven, you know, where you have one God that decides everything. Uh, and um, well, this is this is what we have now. And this is possibly one of the metaverses where we're going to, to, to live and there is no due process there i mean these systems are centralized are closed and they decide and they rule cases as they wish and they own everything so they can like basically take or you know give or take whatever they want the metaverse we want to win is uh decentralized metaverse like this one which is called the central land and this is a metaverse blockchain enabled that is more if the other metaverse is like a monarchy this is more like a republic where you know people are there are rules to be followed and there's going to be a system for this resolving dispute that also uh, will have a due process uh, embedded there it can be clear or it can be another but um i think the the, the question that we want to ask ourselves and uh, especially here, we, where we have an audience which is mainly made of lawyers. So what does due process look like for in the metaverse age? Uh, I mean, due process, yeah, I agree, it's important, but what, what exactly means, right? And remember, when the notions of due process um, of arbitration as we know it now were developed, this was in New York in the 50s. I mean, this is what Times Square looks like in the 50s I mean, in new york and you look at the companies of the advertisement what are the what were the products that people consumed then uh, i mean and this is the, the people who developed the your convention were living in this world um this is more like what times square looks like in the you know um, metaverse uh right so um so and this is what we have to have in mind when we develop uh, the new ideas of our due process for, for the metaverse world. So what I propose to, to all of you, like we have to start thinking what would be the equivalent of the New York Convention now for, for the metaverse age. New York Convention of the 50s was great for a time of um, you know, international trade, international investment, oil and gas, it's awesome. I know. What does this look like for the 20, 30 years to come in the future? So 
that's a very important question that we hopefully can answer together. So thank you very much. Thank you, Fede, and uh, and thank you for um, nodding us in the direction of the New York Convention because that uh, leads us to our next topic, which is enforcement. Uh, and I have, uh, Sean has a couple of points on this and then I'll move on to Colin because there's a question directly for him in, um, in the Q&A to do with uh, enforcement and interaction with the real world. But Sean, first, please. Yeah, so I mean, again, the, the, the responses in, in, the, in the poll were, were very, very well informed and I was glad to see it. And again, we, we kind of saw a predominance of, of one major point and, and that point really was obviously it's ideal and it's very efficient to have this on-chain enforcement uh, because everything can be executed automatically, just as in, in Federico's great, um, great uh, infographic there. Um, but obviously everyone also recognized that you need effective and diverse off-chain enforcement uh, methods and types uh, for the very reason that obviously we don't live our full lives on-chain. No one does, and, and very few disputes, therefore, uh, live only on-chain. And being able to get to assets that are off-chain is obviously a very, very important thing to, to be able to do. So I think that was the, the, the major point that was made. And, and from my point of view, when, when looking at on-chain uh, enforcement, we need to all bear in mind the fact that, again, just as in Federico's um, example there, it really requires a, a private autonomy and a consent element at the start of, of any of this because smart contracts and, and on-chain enforcement are only an execution mechanism. And therefore it, it's all well and good to say that, oh, but if we had blockchain arbitration, everything would be very, very smooth. Yes, but you need to get buy-in by the users, by the parties who are going to, if they're gonna use an escrow, say again, as in, as in Federico's example, they need to put their money where their mouth is in, in that dispute, because if they don't, then there could be no on-chain enforcement. Um, the, 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 the smart contract needs to have access to the assets that are in dispute for it to work. Now, obviously it's very, very easy, as we've said, uh, as the rest of uh, the panelists have said, in a centralized world, because you can bake that into your terms of use. You can say, okay, I'm Facebook, this is my metaverse. If you buy an NFT from us, you automatically um, say that we own it in the event that uh, we decide against you and we can return it to whoever or, or, or however we want to deal with, with ownership. So those kind of on-chain uh, methods are obviously uh, can happen, but in a decentralized world, you still need that private autonomy, that consent element. And I think that's, that's a very important point. Um, I mean, the concept of ownership uh, in the metaverse is a topic unto itself uh, and, and, and how it, it is completely challenging the notions of ownership that we have uh, in the offline world. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to Colin and, and Bjorn Arp's question. He says, what, how do we deal with the transition from the real world to the metaverse? And I would say, and back again, I mean, how, how are we seeing in terms of enforcement and, and getting what you what you want out of the dispute resolution system because that's that's the whole point of it obviously if you don't yeah. have the gods taking money and giving away um and if you have you know a truly community driven system does how is that interaction managed well so i will say that again my my uh first first hand experience is in the world of e-commerce and uh the systems that we built for online disputes looked very different than the systems that we're building for offline disputes. And I think that they are, they are gonna be fundamentally different. I have to say, I, again, I, I'm excited about blockchain. I'm excited, excited about smart contracts. I'm excited about um, decentralized finance, decentralized justice. But I would say within the walled garden of one of these environments, those technologies aren't really that necessary. I mean, if I could create uh, my own metaverse, well then, you know, at eBay, in essence, we own PayPal. So we didn't need virtual currencies. We didn't need a blockchain. We were the blockchain. You know, the, the users couldn't come in and change the data in our system. We were the administrator. And at, as, as Federico noted, you know, we were kind of like the gods. We decide who gets to be in there, who isn't in there. And when they opted in to eBay and PayPal and they came into our, our walled garden, they agreed to abide by our terms and conditions and they were locked into our software platform. So I think a lot of these questions that we're asking presume a level of decentralization. And I would say based on my experience with web one and web two, I, don't, I think we are going to have centralization. I think the users are going to quickly gravitate towards environments 
where they know that there is an administrative agent that is managing the system and they are providing the trust infrastructure. And that's why people select that system. If you look at a GE, and I know our friend Mike McElrath did this, you know, GE created a captive private marketplace where all of their suppliers had to opt into that marketplace. And then they created the dispute resolution rules. They created the escrow rules. They created the payment rules. Now, if you're just on the wider internet and everybody's an individual actor and you're in the chaos of the internet, you don't have the benefit of all of that trust infrastructure. And that's why I think if code is going to be law, we have to opt into metaverses or communities, online communities where that trust infrastructure is put in place. And so I'm a little bit skeptical about the notion that we're going to be able to provide a trust infrastructure for the whole, the wider internet. I think that what we're going to see is centralization and the creation of, of solutions on a case by case basis. Now, getting back to Bjorn's point, how are we going to bring in information like, like relevant information about challenging arbitrators or even evidence if somebody is engaged in an arbitration? Now, that is a place where I see blockchain could be very interesting. If we are engaging in transactions, if we are creating uh, contracts, if we are creating new IP, and then in real time, we are putting the information, the records of that creation into the blockchain so it can't be altered. If later an arbitration is convened, if we can go back and look at that unchangeable information and say, okay, what information was captured at the point where this transaction originally occurred, it's almost like an unchangeable security camera is running on the, in the metaverse 24-7. And if we ever have a dispute, we can go back to that footage and we know that it's genuine yeah. because it can't be changed. Yeah. So I think this notion of the chaos of evidence and the chaos of arbitrator past behavior, that's part of the problem of decentralization. And I think metaverse centralization is going to solve it with some of these tools. So Excellent. it's a great question, Bjorn. Excellent point. Yes, thank you very much. We're almost uh, at the, uh, out of time. I just wanted to perhaps close by saying, I guess, my takeaway from all that we've discussed is watch out for who the next gods are. They're going to be important. And I wanted to thank very much my fantastic panel, Sean, Colin, Ale, Federico, uh, for their insight at the audience, for your participation uh, ahead of time and at this event. And uh, Miles, I don't know if you wanted to, uh, to say one last word before we close. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. I just wanted to thank again all of you Sophie as the moderator and, and, and all of the discussion leaders. I mean, it's been really extraordinarily interesting, um, very insightful. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who's attended this event. Um, we will be following up in the, uh, the coming days and weeks um, with some outputs from this discussion um, and look forward to seeing you all again at future events. So again, thank and you. on our deck, of course. Well, absolutely, of course. All right, guys, thank you. Bye. The Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. To access advice for businesses that is regularly updated, please visit mishcon.com.